Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and today is September 6th, and today we're going to look at Numbers 12. Now, just by way of reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes or so. So let's get to our reading today from Numbers chapter 12. And Numbers chapter 12 says this, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Now when the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned towards Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to them, O my Lord, do not punish us, because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, O God, please heal her, please. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit on her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazareth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Well, this is our reading today from Numbers chapter 12. In yesterday's episode, we looked at an outbreak of grumbling in the midst of God's people, a sin that we said would never be included in one of the seven deadly sins, but one that nonetheless had deadly consequences. Many of those who grumbled lost their lives as God judged them for their sin, and as Moses, who was himself caught up in their sin, failed to intercede for them. You might think that a series of events like that would have had such a sobering effect on the community at large that no one would dream of grumbling about anything, at least for a while. Well, unfortunately, that was not the case. As a philosopher, Hegel once astutely observed, the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. He could have been writing the epitaph of Old Testament Israel and perhaps our epitaph as well. The reality for us is that we too often fail to apply the life lessons with which the scripture presents to us, only recognizing our mistake after we have made them yet again. And what more do we need to learn about the sin of grumbling? Now, in Numbers 12, though the sin is the same, the dynamics of grumbling are different. The occasion for the grumbling in chapter 11 was the difficulty of life in the desert. So when life was hard for Israel, the temptation was to idealize the good old days of the past and then to complain about the present. The root of their grumbling at those times was unbelief that doubted the reality of the future promises of God and even despised the goodness of the present provision of God. In this case, however, Miriam and Aaron grumbled not because they compared their present to an imagined golden past, but because they compared their situation to that of somebody else. In this case, Moses. The root of their sin was not so much unbelief as it was envy. Now, like grumbling, envy is an underrated sin today. Grumbling is perhaps our national pastime in America, but envy is the motor that drives our economy. Many television commercials 
work because they stir up envy in our hearts. In fact, we are encouraged to envy our neighbor's car, our neighbor's house, even things as trivial as the fluffiness of our neighbor's towels, which of course is due to their using the right fabric softener, right? We are constantly urged to envy anything our neighbor has that we don't. Now, in our culture, the commandment is no longer thou shall not covet anything that belongs to thy neighbor, but rather thou shalt covet everything thy neighbor has and thou shalt acquire as much of it as thy credit cards will permit. Envy is no longer viewed as a sin, but as a civic virtue. And so Miriam and Aaron were sucked into grumbling through the path of envy. They even set themselves and their situation side by side with that of Moses and found cause for complaint. Miriam was a chief instigator in this sin. Her name is listed first, and the Hebrew verb used at the beginning of Numbers 12 is feminine. Now, once again, though grumbling proved to be contagious, Aaron, too, was caught up in the sin of grumbling along with his sister. So the first ground for their grumbling was that Moses had married a non-Israelite, a Cushite, in verse 1. So Cush in the Old Testament describes two separate locations, Ethiopia and Midian. Therefore, this could potentially be a reference to Zipporah, a Midianite girl who Moses married before his return to Egypt in Exodus 2.21. However, the fact that the narrator takes the time to confirm the accuracy of their charge that Moses had indeed married a Cushite suggests that Moses had taken another wife more recently, either after the death of Zipporah or in addition to Zipra. And clearly, though, the issue was the fact that Moses' wife was not an Israelite and that Miriam and Aaron started speaking against Moses because of it. Now, notice that Miriam and Aaron didn't talk to Moses about the problem, nor did they talk to God about the problem. Instead, they simply grumbled about it, complaining to anybody who would listen about Moses' unfitness to be the sole leader of the people. And in that way, they began to feel superior to Moses. This is a classic pattern for us as as much as for them. When there is an issue between us and somebody else, it is much easier simply to grumble about the person instead of going to them or her and seeking to resolve the issue. Biblically, though, the right thing to do when you see your brother or sister caught in a sinful behavior that seems to you to be sinful is to go to them and raise the issue with them privately per Matthew 18:15. Now, such persons may not know that their behavior is wrong or that you find it offensive. So, much of our grumbling about others would be choked off at the source if we just committed ourselves to solving interpersonal problems in a biblical manner, going first to the offending party and seeking to resolve the issue with them. So, when we bring our concerns to another person, though, we need to be aware that sometimes the problem is with our conscience and not with that individual's behavior. In this case, though, there was no disputing the facts. Moses had indeed married a Cushite woman. The dispute was whether that was a problem. Miriam and Aaron thought Moses' behavior was wrong, while Moses thought his behavior was appropriate. Which of them was right? Well, in terms of the law of God, marrying a Cushite was not a sin. At this point in the word of God, there was no explicit prohibition in God's word against marrying outside of Israel. And yet equally, there are plausible grounds for Miriam and Aaron's concern. Israel had already been warned of the danger of intermarrying with the Canaanites when they came to live in the promised land because of the danger of being drowned away, drawn away from worshiping the one true God to follow idols. Marriage outside the covenant community was not forbidden except for marriage to the tribes that occupy the land of Canaan. And yet it was potentially risky behavior. There, there was the inherent danger of marrying somebody who might not share your spiritual values. The key point is that it was not forbidden by God. God per se. So perhaps Marion and Aaron would have claimed simply to be concerned for Moses' spiritual wel welfare. But the fact is that they sought to safeguard it in the wrong way by expanding the scope of the law beyond what God had decreed. Now, this kind of legalism continues today to be a problem in the church. Out of our zeal to keep and even protect the law of God, we can easily surround it with all kinds of human traditions and regulations that in the end may choke 
out the intent of the law in the first place. So, in our zeal to protect ourselves and others against the flux of sex and violence that the entertainment industry turns out, some would impose a complete ban on watching movies and even reading novels where scripture does not. Now, in an attempt to keep the Sabbath a special day for the Lord, we can surround it with so many restrictions that it becomes a day more reminiscent of the emptiness of hell than the joys of heaven. So, what is more, we can easily confuse or even our own personal interpretation of God's law with the law itself revealed in the word so that we look down our noses on anybody who seeks to obey God's law in any way other than the way that we deem correct. And if we have the power to do so, we may then bind the conscience of others to do as we say. If we don't have the power to compel others to follow us, we may even look down on them as unspiritual and may then gossip and grumble to others about these people's deviant behavior. Well, in either case, we have set ourselves up as masters and judges of others in the realm of which God alone is Lord and judge. Christian liberty, the freedom to apply God's law in good conscience, untrammeled by the tradition and even the teaching of men, however, well-intentioned, is an important biblical principle. How can you tell if you have fallen into this kind of legalism? Well, the classic fruit of legalism is a judgmental attitude that feels proud of our law-keeping and even looks down our noses on others who don't do things the same way we do. Miriam and Aaron simply didn't think that marrying a Cushite was unwise. They felt that they were better than Moses because they had been more kosher related Relationships. If you think more highly of yourself than others do because you don't drink or smoke or watch certain forms of entertainment, then you are likely in the grips of this kind of legalism. Ironically, even the law of Christian liberty can become its own legalism so that some believers look down on those who don't exercise as much freedom as they do. A true love for the law of God, however, seeks to find the best ways to obey God's word in our own lives and even to help others discern for themselves what obedience would look like in their own situation. A true love for the law of God never leads to pride because the more we understand the searching depths of God's law and its thoroughgoing claims on our hearts, the more we see the depths of our own sinfulness. And even the more we recognize our own sinfulness, the more grateful we are for the good news that the perfect righteousness of Christ has satisfied the claims of God's law upon us. We stand before God accepted on the basis of the Lord's obedience in Christ Christ and not on our own. And so where so where is there any room for pride? Now the second ground for Mary and Aaron's grumbling, it exposed the real issue in their hearts. The fact that the Cushite marriage was a smokescreen for their real concerns, it can be seen from the fact that God didn't even address it in his response to them. The primary issue was the question in verse 2. Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Here the note of envy comes out clearly. Moses had a unique place of leadership in God's people in spite of Marian's and Aaron's way of thinking of his marriage as dubious, but they felt they should share that place because they too had received God's revelation. Perhaps this complaint was triggered by the events in the previous chapter. Moses had grumbled about this unique leadership role, and the Lord had responded by empowering the 70 elders with the gift of his spirit in Numbers 11.25. Now, in a sense then, the Lord had himself demonstrated that Moses was not entirely unique, and therefore Miriam and Aaron felt the time was ripe for a little more recognition for themselves. Perhaps what was really shaped was that in response to that issue, the Lord had chosen the 70 elders to assist Moses and not Miriam and Aaron. Well, in any case, the heart of their grumbling was envy. God dealt with somebody else, Moses, in a way that they felt was better than the way they had dealt with them, even though they had not married outsiders as he had. Envy is a potent source of grumbling in our lives. We too grumble because our lives aren't as good as we imagined somebody else to be. In an envy-driven grumbling, the same two steps pertain in our case as in the case of Mary and Aaron. We first compare ourselves to others and declare ourselves better than them. And then we compare our situation to theirs and then complain because our situation is not as attractive as theirs. So, in the case of unbelief, our perception may be a long way from reality. And in the first place, our claim to be better than the other person may be based on false standards, on legalism, rather than a true assessment of God's law. So, in addition, though, our assessment that somebody else's situation is better than ours may also be flawed. 
Now, in the last chapter, Moses would probably, quite happy, have gone and given Miriam and Aaron not only a share of his authority, but all of it. He might have well said to them, take these people, please be my guest. You lead them, and I'll go back to taking care of a few sheep. That's a much easier calling. In fact, we might even be surprised how often the very people whom we envy would actually envy us as well. That is because envy downplays everything that is positive about our situation and even emphasizes the negative while doing the opposite of, about the other person's situation. So married people may envy the freedom of single people while, while those who are single envy the connectedness of families. So those uh, with important and even demanding jobs may envy the lighter load of those with a simpler schedule, while those who feel stuck in a rut may envy the significance of doing a job that really seems to matter. Envy rarely sees things as they really are. And if the cure for grumbling rooted in unbelief is faith, then the antidote for grumbling rooted in envy is contentment. And contentment is not a naive closing of the eyes to the difficulties that face you or your situation. Rather, it is a solid assessment of who you are in Christ and a sure confidence that no matter how difficult your life may be, it comes to you personally from the hand of your sovereign Heavenly Father. In fact, the first step towards contentment is knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. Who are you? You are an unprofitable servant, desiring eternal judgment, saved by the grace of God and his mercy alone. The great St. John Newton, author of the M Amazing Grace, certainly understood who he was. He had inscribed on his tombstone, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, who was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. The knowledge of who he was gave him the humility and even the godly contentment that breath through all of his writings. And so the apostle Paul knew the path to contentment through was through accurate knowledge. That is why he declared to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So the first half of the verse doesn't strike us as too bad. We surely want to proclaim the lordship of Christ over all things. And now the second half of the verse of the verse hits us where it hurts. We proclaim ourselves as your servants for Jesus sake. We would typically much rather proclaim ourselves as your leaders for Jesus sake and take center stage in the church. However, that's not what Paul is saying here. He understood that in Christ's kingdom, leadership means service. So if we truly understand that we too are simply unprofitable servants in the kingdom of God, how can we think of ourselves as better than those around us? Are we really free from certain sins that embroil others in their grip? It is only because God in his grace has kept us out of the grip of those sins or has released us from them. It is not us. It is all his work. Are we more accepted by God because of our law keeping than they are? Well, that's not true either. If we are able to come to the presence of God, it is on the basis of Christ's merit alone, not ours. So why do we think that we are better than them? If we are not better than them, though, what basis do we have to envy their situation? And if we recognize that we truly deserve eternal judgment, how can we be discontented with our present circumstance? Is our present life really hellish? Or is it, in fact, the perfect program of sanctification for our souls designed personally for us by the God who is working all things together for our good? And if that's true, then everything we face, whether good or bad, must be part of that sovereign plan. Why would we long to exchange our perfect plan for somebody else's plan of sanctification? Their plan may look easier to us, but even if it is, and remember, appearances can be deceptive, it still wouldn't meet our needs. Godly contentment cures envy-driven grumbling. Now, the grumbling of Miriam and Aaron was not answered by Moses. His behavior in this chapter is a living affirmation of the narrator's description of him as more humble than anybody else on the face of the earth. And so Moses knew who he was before God, and so he didn't feel the need to stand up for his own rights and his own status. A servant doesn't feel the need to fight for the right to bear a towel. It's only when we misconceive Christian leadership as being like the world's model that we start to defend our own turf. Instead, it was the Lord who heard the words of Miriam and Aaron and responded to them, just as he heard the earlier grumbling of the Israelites and responded in judgment. The Lord summoned all three of them to the entrance of the tenant meeting, where he separated out Aaron and Miriam, summoning them forward to hear his words. 
Don't miss the irony in the Lord's way of dealing with them here. They claim to hear God's word as Moses did. Now they would indeed hear the Lord's words, but only words of judgment. Now the Lord's words to them, first of all, affirm the fundamental difference between the revelation that he gave by Moses and that which came through all the other prophetic mediators. To the prophets, God's word came in vision and dreams, according to verse 6, and riddles rather than clear speech in verse 8. But the Lord spoke to Moses clearly face to face, literally mouth to mouth not in obscure forms. Such clear revelation by God through his servant Moses demanded their submissive respect rather than any arrogant claims of equality. Now, this passage is very important for our understanding of the scripture as a whole. It teaches us that not all scripture is equally clear, nor is it all to be interpreted in the same way. Now, sometimes you'll hear people insist that the prophetic books like Daniel and Revelation, they must be interpreted exactly like the rest of the Bible by means of plain interpretation. So whenever the prophets speak of Israel, these people say they can only mean literal physical Israel, not the church. And when they speak of a final battle with participants from particular named countries, that must mean a literal battle with precise, precisely those nations. There isn't space here to talk about in this episode fully this issue, but it is important to see that this passage in Numbers, it teaches us that this is explicitly not the way the Bible teaches us to read the prophets. On the contrary, we should expect the prophets to contain much that is difficult and even obscure vision and dreams in contrast to the clear and the straightforward manner in which we read the writings of Moses in the books of the law. Now, there is even a, an, another, even more important implication of our text. If it is true that the revelation that came by Moses demanded our reverent submission, how much more must that be the case now that we have the whole of God's revelation in the word of God? You see, the writer to Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In other words, the revelation that we have available to us in the word of God is even greater than that which came by Moses because it includes God's word to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Moses was a faithful servant of God, but Jesus is the son. And he speaks with all the authority of the father, according to Hebrews 3, 5 through 6. So how shall we escape God's judgment? If we rebel and even speak against Jesus Christ, since he is so much greater than Moses. Well, we have the full and the final revelation of God in the completed word of God, and that demands our submission. Our hearts must be content to bow before the word of God, accepting whatever it teaches as the undoubted revelation of God's nature and his will for our lives. So to speak against the word of God is to speak against the authority that God himself has, has instituted. Now, such acts of rebellious grumbling against the Lord, they lead to judgment. They certainly did in the case of Miriam and Aaron. Miriam, as an instigator, was struck with a skin disease so that her skin became like snow, white and flaky, in verse 10 of our chapter today. The punishment fitted the crime. She grumbled against Moses because he had married a Cushite, a woman who would likely have had darker skin than the Israelites, whether she was from Ethiopia or Midian, and God turned her skin as white as snow. So, in addition, her complaint was that she and Aaron, too, had equal access to God as channels of revelation. So, her punishment was a disease that excluded her permanently, not merely from God's presence, but from the community of the people of God. Now, there was certainly no chance of her ever being regarded as the equal of Moses in appearing before the Lord. And so, the folly of Aaron's claim to equality with Moses Moses was similarly exposed by the Lord. Faced with the judgment uh, on his sister, Aaron could not go directly to God to seek its removal by himself. Instead, he went to Moses to ask him to intercede for her in verse 11. Miriam's fate depended on the intercession of the one that they had wronged. And so Aaron went to Moses and requested that this state of living death like that of a stillborn child might be removed from her. How would you have responded to Aaron's request? How do you respond when somebody who has wronged you and gossiped against you comes to you to confess his or her sin? Many of us might have uh, been tempted to rub in the appropriateness of the judgment that Miriam was facing. Well, not so with Moses. Instead, he did exactly as Aaron had requested, bringing Miriam's need before the Lord. Now, notice how this confirms the reality of what the Lord had earlier told Miriam and Aaron. 
God not only spoke to Moses, he listened to him as well. They had a face-to-face relationship. And yet, in this case, Moses' intercession was only partially granted. Miriam was healed of the disease immediately, and yet he still had to remain outside the camp for seven days. The normal period of shameful quarantine that defilement through disease, skin disease carried with it. Her sentence was reduced, but was not entirely removed. Now, the parallel that the Lord makes between her state and that of a woman disgraced by her father, it shows that the issue here is not cleansing as such, but bearing shame. She had to bear the disgrace of her actions for a limited time. After that, she could be brought back into the camp. Her sin fully atoned for. Meanwhile, the entire community put their lives on hold until Marion was restored. Now, Marion received mercy from the Lord. She didn't have to bear the full consequences of her actions, which would have left her permanently in the realm of death. However, she didn't receive the same level of grace that you and I have received from the Lord. She bore her own disgrace outside the camp, but our disgrace has been fully taken from us in Jesus Christ. Our grumbling, whether flowing from unbelief or from envy, it deserves nothing less than permanent death. We too should be shut out of the camp of the people of God, for our souls are defiled by the reality that skin disease pictured for Israel. We are stillborn creatures, spiritually speaking, our wholeness eaten away by the cancer of our sin from the moment we were born. How can a holy and pure God welcome such horribly disfigured and malformed creatures into his presence like you and I? Well, the answer is that he has taken our disfigurement into himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. His perfect, pure wholeness was taken and dragged outside the camp there to be maltreated they disfigured his appearance with whips and with thorns they pierced his flesh with nails and a spear none of that awful abuse could match the experience of being disfigured with the load of our sin that he bore Was he not the one with whom God spoke face to face from all eternity? Was he not the one who saw the Lord more clearly than any created being? And yet on the cross, he became the one abandoned by God, the one spat upon by his own father. All of this was because he was bearing the solemn burden of our sin in our place. Jesus endured the pains of death in the grave three days before he was brought back in triumph, before he emerged from the tomb victorious, interceding for those who grumbled against him and wronged him. So what is the cure for the grumbling that flows from envy? It is the cross of Jesus Christ alone. There God paid the price for your unworthy soul and for mine. There he purchased us back to be his servants, weak and feeble though we are. And when we contemplate the greatness of his grace to us in the cross, we cannot doubt that he has our best interests at heart and the way that he has brought our circumstances together even though they are different from the circumstances of others around us. And if God did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us as he did, then what do we really think he is holding back from us? As Romans 8.32 says, If you have been grumbling against others, come before God and freely confess your sin. Ask Jesus Christ to intercede for you with the Father. He will bring your case before the throne of God himself, and God will hear him and answer his pleas for you. Remember God's grace to you at the cross. Let that remembrance transform your perspective on your situation into a fresh contentment with God's plan for your life as revealed in the word and a new determination to submit yourself to the direction of his word fully and completely. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is September 6th, and we've looked at Numbers 12. Well, until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.